Hi everybody, greetings from Germany. Um, we made it amid this global crisis. We hope everybody's healthy and safe. Um, I just wanted to give you a little intro to this video. This week I was asked to go into ICMP, which is a music college in London, and talk with the third year performance students about performance and um, some of my experiences in the industry. Um, so I talk about my career and I talk about um, vocal health and technique and stamina and things on the road and I've tried to answer a few of their questions. So I just thought I'd chop together some bits and um, give you an insight into what I was talking about. Um, I'm planning on doing some more videos in the coming days and weeks. So um, please keep your eyes peeled and uh, hit subscribe and uh, hopefully see you very soon. Peace. Yeah, hi. So um, this is Mark said, um, my name's Jesse. I, um, I've been a professional musician since I left school, which was when I was 18. Um, I've never really done anything apart from make money by doing gigs and releasing music. I've done everything, you name it, from playing in a bar with like by myself with one couple sat there to playing to 40,000 people in a stadium. I've done every type of gig you can imagine. Um, every type of touring from being in a car to being in a van to being on a tour bus to being on private jets. I've done the whole range and then I've come back down to earth and done the rubbish stuff again and then I've done cool stuff again. And, and when I left school I was in a band and we basically moved into a house together and we, we were just gigging and having crazy parties for a few years. Um, and then I ran out of money and decided I wanted to try and get something that was going to sustain me financially. Um, and so I auditioned for a show called Bohemian Rhapsody, which was like quite a... Uh, it was a, it was a sort of theatre-y Queen show, but it just a band with some singers, basically. I ended up getting that gig, and that was my first sort of professional tour, and I went on the road with that, touring theatres, and I think it was three months long. And at that point, I was a, I was a good singer, and I did it well, but I was quite inconsistent. I, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't had any real formal training at that point, and Sometimes I'd feel brilliant, and other times it was a struggle, you know, because Queen's difficult stuff to sing or play or whatever. Um, so then I went and had some really intense vocal training, one-to-one -one training with an amazing coach called Juliet Caton. And the, the technique stuff that I learned from these vocal lessons just totally changed my whole life and career. She really taught me the science of the voice, and it's the same with any instrument. Once you once you have a real foundation of technique, um, it just immediately makes you more sustainable as a performer and be and be able to play for longer and and be consistent. And it's I guess it's a little different if you're a guitarist or a drummer because if you feel sick, maybe you can push yourself and get through the show. But as a singer, this is your instrument, so you know you have to. You have to still, I've had so many times in my career where I've had to go on stage even though I feel so ropey and I'm tired and my voice is hurting. But luckily I've got good enough technique to, to manipulate my voice to make, make it sound so the audience would barely tell the difference whether I'm feeling fine or feeling rubbish. So yeah, after, basically after I had all this vocal training, I then auditioned for a show called Thriller Life, which is a uh, Michael Jackson show. Some of you might have seen it all you see the scene of it is this one um, and it's, uh, it's a Michael Jackson show um, in the West End I did the tour first um, and it's basically a band and this dude who dances like Michael Jackson and does the kind of look-alike thing and then there's four singers but the beauty of it was having just had all these vocal lessons I could really put that technique stuff into practice um, on stage because by the time you've done 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 shows, you're not thinking about the show anymore, you're not thinking about your lyrics, you're not thinking about you know, where you are on stage. All you're thinking about is how to de deliver the song and, um, and also I was able to play around my vocal technique a lot um, and I think it really helped in the long run, it felt pretty difficult at the time. Um, after I did the tour, I went into the West End with the show, so 
and that was like another nine months, I think. So I think all in all, even after I left, I went back and did some more shows and helped out from time to time, but I did over 700 shows with, with Thriller. Um, yeah, just doing that many gigs is just so good for, for your stamina and learning how to, how to do it consistently, uh, mentally as well as physically. Because the, the audience deserve the same performance that you gave the night before and the night before that. Um, so it's about sustaining yourself mentally as well as physically. I've always found it quite interesting, the balance between being a, a working session musician and being an artist. Because I know some people would rather work in Starbucks and just do their own music, which I kind of get, fair enough. You're an artist, you don't want to play covers, you don't want to do anything else. But for me, I, I always found I would rather earn money doing music than than have to, you know, have to get another job to su subsidise my own art. And that's what I've always done, and I've always been, you know, lucky uh, in, in my gigs, but I've worked really hard to get cool, you know, try, try and do both simultaneously. That shows what I watched at Tyson Fury, Man United, and, uh, <laughs> rock and roll. Wow. But with all, with all these performances, the number one thing for me always is about the song itself, about what is the writer trying to make the audience feel with this piece of music. And um, I obviously I write songs as well myself, so I think it's the job of all of us as musicians to try and work out what, what we're trying to make the audience feel. And, if, and if, if the message of the song is forefront of your brain, your performances are always going to be really, really genuine. Um, and that doesn't matter whether you're a singer or a bass player or a drummer or a guitarist. And it's about having the, having the musical and emotional intelligence to, to deliver that message. Does that, does that make sense? Um, and you know, it's not just about things that are very sad. You know, it's, it's the same with, with things that are very joyful or things that, uh, you know, if the song is about jealousy, how, how do you feel when you're jealous? How, physically, how do I feel when I'm jealous? If I see someone that I'm jealous of, am I tense? And how my how my shoulders, how my hands, you know, how how's my face? So many singers just will just stand and sing a song. And I think the 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 breakthrough performances, the the great performers, are the ones that take their ego out of the equation. We're just we're just uh, a channel from the writer to the to the audience. And if, if you do that as a whatever instrument you play, then that's that's when you're gonna really reach people, really touch people. I think a bit of both. A bit of both. Like if I love nothing more than people rocking out at the front. It's great. Yeah. But you've got to remember those people in the pit have paid the same amount of money as the people at the back. So I think you have a responsibility to play play each circumstance as it comes, you know. I always try and say, if I'm in a theatre and I can see the whites of people's eyes in the front row, of course, you know, sing to them and, and bring them into what you're doing. Um, but, you know, even if the lights are bright and you can only see the first few rows, you've got to at least pretend that you're singing to the rest of them too, you know. Even simple things like scanning an audience, that's something I learned a long time ago. So. You take the person in the bottom left hand corner and the person at the top right of the balcony and you just slowly sing to them and then you sing to them and then you sing to them and you just scan. And in, in three seconds, you've brought the whole audience into your performance. You, you, you know, because you're, even though you're not, you can't physically sing to all of them, that as your eye line goes past them, they feel like you're involved in them. And it doesn't matter whether you're playing guitar and you're, you're looking around, you know, it's just, if you're staring just ahead and you're, you're thinking about your lyrics and it's all insular. You're not, you're not connecting with these with people. But again, if, if I'm in a space like that church, people can see the movement in your eyebrows and they can see, the, they can see the, if you're tense and they, they can feel it more. They, you, you know, it's a, it's a more, much more intimate performance. Um, so that would, that would be different, you know. I could. I've never seen the same the, the song the same way. Um, 
emotionally anyway. I might sing it pretty much verbatim, note for note, if that's the way, the best way the song sounds. But emotionally, it's always slightly different. And if you're thinking about the emotion and the lyric and the message, every time you sing it, you'll go on a different journey with it. Um, and yeah, and you know, you just have to remember, like, especially if you're doing a big, like a stadium or something, um, or a big arena, everything's just got to be bigger. You know, just the hand movements and the, the power of what you're doing has to be a bit stronger. And, that's and it sounds boring, but you know, in terms of rehearsal and learning stuff, you know, if you've routine that song a hundred times, there's no need to be nervous about the performance because you know it. You're not going to mess it up. You're, it's in your subconscious. So the more you practice, the more you actually get rid of your own ego because you can relax into the performance and just go, okay, now, now I'm relaxed enough to be able to deliver this. Um, you know, which, like Mark's saying, that's, you know, it's, it's one of the most boring things, isn't it, about technique and practice, but you know, that's why you do that stuff, to allow yourself to be free up there and, and to really, really deliver. And it's something that takes lots of time and practice, to do it safely anyway, but yeah. essentially, Essentially, it's a growl, you know, okay. it's a yeah. so what I've learned over time is to really control that so mm -hmm. that I can add in as much grit or as little grit as I want. Okay. If I've got a dial of grit, it's yeah. something like this. Okay. And if you really practice that over time, you can, you can add in the grit. It's just, it's just about learning how to push and pull. And yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's why technique is so important, you know, because you're not guessing. You're working yeah. to a set of rules, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know that, you know, I, I know if I'm tired that I just, I just pull off a bit, you know, yeah. I don't give as much distortion. But, and if I'm a bit tired, I can still deliver the same performance vocally. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, um, I can't recommend enough, you guys. Um, you know, just just learning some some proper vocal technique, um, mm -hmm. just for longevity. You know, I mean, I had my first proper lessons when I was, like I said earlier, when I was about 22, 23, yeah. having already done a pro tour, and a lot of people think oh, I don't want vocal lessons because I don't want to change my sound and I don't want to do this. But for some reason, like a violin player would never go, I don't want lessons. So the piano people player. look at it as if it's a bad thing to get yeah. lessons. They, yeah. want, they want to say that they're self-taught and yeah. I've done this by myself. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but honestly, I mean, it changed my whole career having vocal lessons because I suddenly knew how to look after my instrument. And if you know how to make those sounds, you, know, you, you have this whole palette of colour to choose from when you're choosing your vocal sound. So if I'm record if I'm recording this song in the studio, I could easily go, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's so many different ways you can do it if you know how. If you don't know how, then you've only got one way of doing it. And and this this is the thing. If you only have one way of doing it, that's cool. I'm not judging anybody. Mm -hmm. Like, if you wanna, if you're like, this is the way I sing, and I wanna sing like this forever, that's totally cool. But how about when you're sick? Mm -hmm. Because one day you're gonna go up there, and you're not gonna be able to do that thing that you always do because you're ill. Yeah. So then, then how do you get around it? If I'm, so I would sing, like, oh my god, on a good day. But on a bad day, if I'm ill, I would sing. Which sounds almost the same, but I'm putting in like 20% less effort mm. because I've got I built up the technique over over time. Yeah. Does that does that make sense oh, to you guys? Yeah. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Um, please hit subscribe, and also uh, my band Romance's new single just came out today. So please check out Romance's band um, on YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff. And uh, we have a new single called The Void out today. I'd love it if you could uh, have a listen. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Peace. Bye.